Hey everybody, it is me, it's your old buddy Steve Simonson, and guess what? It's another episode of the Awesomers.com podcast, now long-running series. Uh, this is, in fact, episode number 188, so for those uninitiated, all you have to do is go to Awesomers.com slash 188, and you'll be able to find a couple show notes, details, and uh, a link or two perhaps thrown in as well. So today we're very lucky because we're talking about Europe, we're talking about how we get into Europe and translate, and we've got one of the world's best. We've got Yana with YLT Translations. Say hello, Yana. Hi, Steve. How are you? Thank you for having me today. I'm quite well indeed, and uh, so I'm, I just like to do a little geography lesson number one. Where are you calling in from today? I'm calling from a little place in Europe, Southeast Europe, Belgrade, Serbia. Okay, wow. How about that, everybody? So um, uh, this is a uh, the wonderful world we live in where we can just make calls. We're on the video. We got the uh, podcast. We got the recording. Everything's happening. And we're all across the world. I'm in Seattle. Yana is over there in Serbia. So that is pretty amazing to me. I, I, I love it. Uh, so Yana, let's, let's talk about you a little bit. Uh, give us a little bit about your background and then uh, maybe a little bit of background about YLT as well, if you will. Sure. Um, so I'm a, I'm a translator myself. This is what I went to school for. I got my bachelor's and master's um, in Scandinavian languages. So that's Norwegian and Danish. And I speak five languages and the languages have all been my fashion. And then um, one day I got a job in this uh, Danish uh, startup in Denmark. And uh, I stayed there for about eight years and they, it grew to be uh, the biggest uh, online e-commerce in Northern Europe. And I was their COO. So I was really, really happy to learn everything about e-commerce basically from scratch um, during those eight years. And I also learned a lot about Amazon. Like this is the first time, this was like 10 years ago when I first heard what's a buy box, you know, and like um, how to win the buy box and the, uh, you know, like international marketplaces and stuff like that. That was also my specialty business development. And I've always, uh, I was always interested in e-commerce. So basically e-commerce and languages. And I always wanted to start something on my own and combine my two passions. And this is how I actually got to, to um, establish uh, Wild Tea Translations about roughly three years ago. I love it. Well, this, this kind of unique convergence, uh, there, there's a type of chart. Uh, if it comes to me, I'll say it. But basically, if you just overlap two circles and kind of in the middle, there's that overlap. That's where you found your kind of unique passion and unique unique st skills, right? With both e-commerce and language. Is that fair to say? Yeah, exactly. I think you're looking for a Japanese word. It's called like a kilib, kibilit or something like that. I just actually read about it yesterday. There's like this little middle circle where like all the other like, uh, you know, like uh, spheres of our life come together. And that's, that's right. actually it. And this is actually what happened to me. And, and I was just like, my mind was like so clear that after eight years, I'm like, this is it. This is exactly what I want to do. Like, I want to offer like, you know, solutions for, for sellers who want to expand international, like the cross-border solutions for e-commerce. So actually I started with doing like e-commerce translations, websites, uh, brand stores, basically everything. And then I kind of, I just thought that, you know, Amazon is going to rule the world. And I, I thought it was, everything was going into that direction. And I just decided about two years ago that we're going to niche down to Amazon only. And I was really, really, uh, you know, I was like, let's do this. Like, I don't really care what happens, but I think like, you know, when your gut feeling is saying like, do it. And I was just like, I'm just going to do it. I just have such a good feeling about it. And uh, luckily, I wasn't wrong. Yeah, so I love that it. Was, that was uh, definitely so, a good uh, choice for me. Yeah. Not not just not wrong. You were super right, right? So you already saw yeah, the yeah. Amazon uh, opportunity when you were kind of doing your old gig, and then deciding to niche down. There's some risk that goes along with that, but there's also yeah. the opportunity, right? That specialization. And for those yeah. keeping score at home, uh, a Venn diagram was actually what I was going for. But there could be a Japanese version of that. Uh, I don't happen to know that word. Uh, I've focused so far mostly on one language, uh, although I, I know a couple words in Chinese and uh, even a, a word or two in Spanish uh, at times, uh, tacos, uh, pollo loco, <laughs> uh, those types of things. So uh, first of all, Yana, so I, I love that anybody who can find their passion and then takes the risk, right? So that, that's really uh, awesome in its own right. Uh, so let's talk about when you formed up YLT and you know, was that scary time? Was it a fun time? What was it that like? 
Well, it was absolutely scary because Steve, unlike other awesomers, I didn't think I was awesome to begin with because I'd lacked the courage to quit my job. I just decided to stay in this corporate world for eight years, which is uh, really too long. And I, I was planning on like, you know, quitting my job after like four years. And uh, I just, I didn't have the guts to do it. I was very, very afraid. And uh, I was living in the States at the moment. And, and like over there, it's like, you know, people get so many opportunities, like people push you into like doing new things, like uh, reinventing yourself the whole time. But I think my problem was my mentality because I come from Serbia, from the Southeast Europe. And um, people over there, they were like really afraid to try out new things, especially when it comes to business. Because like usually people just, you know, they have a, a corporate job or any sort of other job and they just stay there until they get retired. And they don't actually understand your urge to try something new and to actually take risks. And so, you know, like I, I learned a lot of those moments like take like that you have to be a risk taker while living in the States, actually talking to people. And then when I, when I come back, I told my mom, like after those eight years, I was just like, look, mom, I'm going to quit my job. And she was like, and what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'll figure it out. I have an idea, but it's going to be an online job. And they're like, oh my God, like, what are you telling me? All my friends were like, okay, like this is a phase. And then you're probably going to go and find a real job, right? Like you're going to go back to the office. And at that point I was like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Like I have this vision. I don't know how I'm going to get to this vision, but I, I know that I have to change something. and I really want to do it. And so like, uh, I didn't have any support from my friends, any support from my parents. They, my dad tried to understand me because he was an entrepreneur himself, but you know, old school offline entrepreneur. So he was like, well, what is all this like internet mumbo jumbo? Like, how do you get like paid? Like, are there like, are there like real bills? You know, if I cannot see them, like, is it even for real? And then it was like a, such a, such a long way for me to actually persuade people that I'm actually going to do something which is new and I might fail, but I was ready to fail. Just, I could do something and tell myself like, okay, you try this and it works or it doesn't work. And like, let's move on or let's do it. Because at that point it was so, so much far away from my comfort zone. I was like, okay, like I need to do this. I need to like get through with this. Uh, if, it, if, it, if it was like somewhere in the middle, I would have been probably like, okay, let's go back to my comfort zone. But because I pushed myself without like overthinking, which I tend to do all the time, I haven't thought it through. I just did it. And I was like, okay, now I really have to do it. And this is actually how, you know, how I kind of persuade myself to pursue this vision and my dream to kind of start something on my own. I mean, in the beginning, it was just like five of us. It was just like, you know, like then you hire a friend for your assistant and then your cousin for something, you know, you kind of, you know, like work with what you have, like people that maybe will work for free until you kind of, you know, um, make more money or something. And like, you know, uh, thinking about that, like right now, like we have 43 full-time team members uh, wow. scattered across like Europe. And, you know, like we're doing so many uh, like amazing things, partnering up with amazing people, like, you know, empowering and, you know, like now I'm on awesomers. And I was, I was just talking today um, with my boyfriend. He's also in the, in the Amazon world, the Lazar. Uh, and I was just telling him like, you know, like when I first met Steve Simonson, like in Prague, the European Soul Conference, I knew about awesomers back then as well. And I was just like, how do I get there? Like, how do, what do I do like to get on this podcast? And then like fast forward, like two, two years later, like I'm actually on this podcast speaking about my journey, you know, and that's just uh, <laughs> absolutely amazing. And I just think that, you know, like a lot of people have had better mindset than I did. And if I could do something for myself in, you know, literally like in a small underdeveloped country in Europe, I think people can like literally do whatever they set their mind to and they it can definitely be awesome. Uh, it just the sky is the limit, and the only obstacle that's stopping you from being there is yourself. So whatever right. you think you cannot do, you can definitely do it. Honestly. So first of all, uh, amazing, amazing origin story, and and I just want to let you know that there's there's hundreds of awesomers out there listening right now who are like, no, that's me. I'm just like Yana. I didn't have the confidence. I didn't know what I was doing. Everybody around me questioned me, right? These are uh, what we call uh, normies, right? Normies don't always understand. Right. We, we can still love normies. It's okay. Uh, they just don't get it. And they're confused by it. And they want what's best for us, right? It, it, intellectually, they want what's best for it. Emotionally, they want what's best. And we're, even in many parts of America, and certainly many parts of the world, especially the developing world, the, the 
innate human drive to something safe, something secure. That's, that's just, it's a normal yeah. thing and that's okay. But awesomers, and, and you, clearly this is in your DNA, Yana, from the very beginning, you're just like, I'm jumping off the cliff. I'll figure out how to fly before I hit the bottom, right? That's kind of yeah, exactly. what you did. Exactly. That, that was exactly that. what I did. Yeah. 43 I'll, like, people. I'll, I'll figure things out like along the way. I'm like, I just not want to do this. I don't know like how I should do this or I have no idea, but I, ha I know I have to do this like right now. And this is exactly what happened to me. Like, you know, I was very shy to talk about my business because I was like, who's going to listen to me? Like, why would, I don't know, somebody listen to what I have to, what, what I have to present or whatever. And I just need, I, and I just knew at that point that I have to get myself out there. And this is also how I got to talk at this um, European solo conference where I met you, actually. This was like so, like, you know, in my, my mind it was like so far-fetched. Like, you know, after I got done with this conference, I'll do this and this. And I'm like, uh, like, what makes you think that you can even do it? And, and I was like so pissed off by myself. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to apply and I'm going to do it. Like, I don't care. Like, I'm so going to do something I don't feel comfortable with. This is like probably the least comfortable thing uh, I've done in my life. I'm not a public speaker. I, I was terrible at, at speaking and actually speaking with confidence. So people can actually think uh, that I know what I'm doing. And I was just like, how do I do this? And then I just got there and I did it. I thought I would faint, but you know what? I didn't. No, I had like did really very good well. content. And I just, you know, and I just went out there and did it. And after I was done, I was just like shaking. I'm like, oh my God, what did this, this just <laughs> happen? I couldn't believe it, you know? And uh, that's just uh, how it is. Like, I just think that the, the further you push yourself outside of your comfort zone without thinking, like without overthinking or going through like so many details and just be like, okay, like I have to do it like now. And this is it. And then you try. And then, you know, maybe you fail. Like, you know, the organizer from this European conference, he said no to me four times. He was oh, like, I love that. No. Oh, see, I'll have yeah, to tell yeah, Augustas, like, uh, he really, he missed, almost missed an opportunity. So yeah, and not I, only I, did you I, apply, actually, you got turned down four times. Yeah, 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 I did. And then he, like the last time, and but I was like, you know, if somebody says no, I really wanted to just, you know, as I told you, like, I knew I had to just be there on the stage and I'll do like whatever it takes. And so he had said like, no, four times. And then the last time he was like, okay, like you're really persistent. Like, let's do like a two minute video for my audience and let's see if they like it. And I'm like, of course, let's do it. It's going to be awesome. And you know, what's the worst thing. Like my name of the company, Wildy Translations, it used to stand for Yana Linguist Team when we were doing like the e-commerce. And I had like no idea like how I should kind of rebrand this into like the Amazon world. And Augustus was like, what does this even mean? Like, what does loyalty stand for? And in that split second, I was like, it stands for your listing translations. And there he was go. like, wow, that's a good name. And I'm like, right? <laughs> oh, that is classic uh, awesome behavior right there. So first of all, I, I want to just remind the awesomers out there listening, uh, Yana's dropping down some very important lessons, right? First of all, push yourself outside of that comfort zone. Don't go halfway because it's too easy to go back, right? You got to fully be off the cliff. And then I just love this idea that you said, hey, I'm, I'm speaking at this thing. I'm going to share what I love. I'm going to share my passion. And then despite being rejected four times, you kept pushing and pushing. And by the way, uh, you know, I was there at that conference in the audience. Uh, and I, you seemed perfectly professional. I never would have imagined that was your first time. Certainly wouldn't imagine that you had a panic attack uh, shaking afterwards, uh, <laughs> but it was amazing. And uh, and I thought very well uh, formulated. I mean, it was just, it was a professional speech and everybody was going, yeah, you know, that actually is a, a good approach. So, uh, well, I listen, I love this as a, as a kind of a, a mini origin story here, but let's, let's get into the, the, the problem that people face when they start thinking about going into Europe because this is a problem that exists for, for awesomers all around the world. Um, you know, not everybody has that uh, linguist innate ability like you do, and, and clearly your team must have as well. So first of all, can you help frame the problem for me? Uh, who are the types of people who come and, and seek out the, uh, a translation service? Who needs this sort of thing? Right. Well, there are actually two types of clients that actually would uh, look look to expand to international marketplaces. Uh, client number one is somebody who has um, hit the wall, let's say on the US marketplace. Um, let's say about 35% of our clients are US based. Then we have the UK 
and Germans. Like that's like the, the majority of our clients. And let's say if we're talking about US, US sellers, they cannot, you know, they cannot hit the wall. They cannot like grow their uh, revenue. Like the, the, like the competition is too strong. Maybe PPC clicks are going through the roof and they just cannot do more than let's say six figures. And it's taking them like, you know, they don't have any life apart from like doing Amazon. And so they, they just like uh, want to explore their options. They really want to get ahead of their competitors on the US soil. And they really want to do something more, something extra. So going that extra mile is like what they consider like expanding to international marketplaces. And um, a lot of them have never even actually tried to see like if they have as many competitors as they do in the US on the German marketplace or on the UK marketplace. And a lot of them are surprised when they see like, oh wait, like I have only three competitors or PPC or you know something is like way, way cheaper. Or maybe I'm the first one here in the Italian marketplace, let alone the Japanese marketplace, which is you know the, uh, as big as the biggest European marketplace. Of course, you have to have some special products for that marketplace, but usually all the best sellers that you're selling in the US marketplace would work for Europe. This is also uh, coming from our experience and we do about, I don't know, roughly around 1000 listings every month. So we've seen basically everything and usually come, people come to us with their best selling products saying, okay, let's try out this and let's see what happens. So that's client type number one. And client type number two is like, I am, you know, I am the, I'm, I, I'm the best seller of these products. In the US, I'm earning, I don't know, seven, eight figures, and I really want to go and conquer Europe as well. So it's all about, you know, like ego. It's like, I'm going to be number one on this marketplace, on that marketplace, and over there. So it's all about like even increasing their revenue even more when you're like dominating your whole marketplace. You, you know, of course, it's kind of logically that you want to expand and you want to be dominant on all other marketplaces because you also see your competitors doing that. And you really want to stay ahead of them and not let them, you know, increase their revenue over, you know, taking over the European marketplaces, what would, which could have been you, for instance. Yeah. So there, I, I can see both those types. Um, and, and the first thing is, uh, th let's not kid ourselves, Osmers. Ego certainly drives uh, more than one behavior in our, in our lives. We are proud when we are making progress. We're proud when our score racks up, right? A lot of times, it's almost like a video game, uh, uh, the analogy that I use, right? When you see the scoreboard right. and that's, you're just clicking refresh every two seconds to see, you know, uh, how your numbers are updating. That's yeah, it. like you're, you always want to check the profit. You know I mean? There's so yeah. many tools. Like people love those profit tools. They just going to click all the time. Yeah. It is. It's like a live stream. So I, back in my early days in e-commerce, I literally would do something that called tailing the log. So I would... I would show let the log file of every visitor on our websites come in and, and it would go by, you know, at first it was kind of slow, but over time we had so much traffic and you just kind of look for, oh, shopping cart, shopping cart, shopping cart. Right, we right, love right. to see that kind of success, all the plans, all the, the energy we put into building something. When somebody adds it to their cart and buys it, that's actually when we, we get the most excited and, and those little uh, programs help us with that. So, all right, so we understand the frame of the problem, which is, we want to get into Europe, whether it's ego, whether it's uh, less competition, it doesn't really matter the, the reason, but we're trying to get there. Um, but how, how, how do we go about doing that? I mean, when somebody says, okay, I'm trying to expand into Europe for one reason or another, what's your first kind of conversation with them like? Well, you know, people come to us when they've already, uh, when they already have their VAT sorted out. So like you really have to uh, sort out a lot of different things and it can take about six to seven months, depending who you work with, but you definitely have to get your products to Europe. You have to get your VAT sorted out. Um, maybe if you want to change a little bit, maybe you want to have different approach. Like when it comes to like um, a plus content, maybe you want to create something special for the marketplace and that is very very important thing to know who you are selling to you really before you translate your listing you really have to spend a little bit of time to do the market research you have to know who your customers are and i really um i just really cannot emphasize uh enough how important it is to just not take your u.s listing and just translate it and put it as it is and present it like that to the german audience you know like u.s listings are like there's like a sales pitch in the bullet. It's like, get it now, buy my product. I'm so amazing. This product is brilliant. While as the German marketplace is like, 
transparency, like show me the materials, like, you know, what's the product good for? How is it going to solve my problem? You don't care about this, like emotionally attached to the product, you know? And there's like a, an ex example of this espresso cup I, I like to use where it says like, um, the first bullet says like, own the enigma, just like your grand grandmother used to play with in front of a fireplace. I don't know, like going into this story. And the German bullet says, thermal isolated glass. This is what they say. It's like straightforward, very clear, <laughs> wow. and just like, you know, get to the point and don't like telling me what your grandma did or whatever. You can, you can just, you know, rabble about that in your A-plus content, but like bullets, for instance, are for key information only. And of course, Germany being uh, the, the worldwide marketplace that gives out most refunds from all of the other marketplaces, it's very, very important to know how this marketplace works because if people think or buyers think that this is something they that they will get something they did not expect you know based on your listing they're just gonna you know take it back and you'll have to refund which is a quite interesting fact and i think a lot of people don't know this and i would really love that this kind of affects their judgments when you know launching things on german marketplace because this can cost you a lot of money just because you want to bring the same style to a different marketplace which has a completely different style and there are so many words which you should you know avoid like uh you know something like super cute awesome adorable stuff like that like that style just doesn't sell well on the german marketplace or saying that something is um humble customer service or humility uh, hu uh, humble i don't know what it just they kind of connect humble to not being very professional so you really want to you just avoid using those phrases and they fit type of talk uh, to your potential buyers because they would just think that like, okay, this is like very weird, you know, like that doesn't sound professional, you know, and uh, visually you just kind of skim through the bullets. And if you like what you see, you're going to scroll down and like go to the A plus, right? If you have one or product description or maybe take a better look at the pictures. But I think that's very, very important. And a lot of people don't have that in mind that you have to know how your audience is like know your audience and understand the marketplace you are gonna sell on yeah well i can't tell you how important it is that uh Osmers take special note of this so first of all the literal translation is not the point right localization is the point and exactly uh you know th there are so many examples uh, i remember yana giving uh, her presentation in Prague a couple years back and and she she gave some examples like hey you know this word here and this word there they mean very different things and if you just literally translate it you're going to look like an idiot um and your your what that means is your 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 sales are not there or you get a bunch of returns i didn't know that return fact about germany i, I love that little nugget yeah. um all of these things are aspects of taking it from you know the 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 simplest equation which is you know, I need my my listing from English to German, or I need my listing from English to Italian, or German to Italian, whatever the case is. That's not actually what you need. You need your listing to sell, right? That's that's what you actually need. And if you're going to do that, you need to have somebody who knows what they're doing help you along that process. That's that's part of the fix to this problem. Am I right about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I just think that you know uh, maybe your product is a bestseller in the U.S. and that is like. In most cases, it will sell well in Europe, but what if it doesn't? Like, what if you didn't do your homework and did not like, you know, search the, the marketplace a little bit? Like, what if it happens that it's not a good fit for the marketplace? And I had a really cool example about Walmart failing on Japanese marketplace. So like Walmart just entered uh, Japan, like, like we are this US uh, brand, like everybody's gonna buy from us. We're well known and et cetera. And, uh, until they were very wrong about that. And like a year later, they had to close like every single store because Japanese people, they love buying locally sourced products, which are nowhere to be found on the Walmart. Uh, they love to go on a treasure hunt for discounts. This is like what they like to do. And Walmart is pretty much like, you know, a lot of stuff are discounted already. They, that's, there's no fun in that for them. And number three is like, they really want to have like this uh, kind of special shopping experience and going to Walmart was nothing special for them. And so they were like not interested at all in like buying anything from Walmart. But uh, Costco, for instance, they are huge in Japan. 
because they could provide this special shopping experience for a Japanese uh, customer because they sell in bulk. And this is not something that Japanese people are used to. And they kind of, they loved it. They're like, oh my God, I'm going to go to Costco and buy like 15 tons of something. And like, oh my God, look at me. This is so cool and experience is amazing. And this is kind of, they, they could grasp the mentality and what the, 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 the marketplace needs and what they find found interesting. So, uh, you know, it's a very, it's a very interesting how Costco is like a very, it's a, it's a typical U.S. brand store where you go and buy in bulk, very typical for the States. And so who would have thought that, you know, Walmart would have failed where, you know, Costco completely su succeeded and is still there to this day, you know? This is a really good lesson. Um, and, and by the way, Awesomers, you should take heed when, when you, if you've tried this before and it didn't go so great, everybody's tried it before and it didn't go so great, right? I mean, so there's <laughs> hits and misses along the way. You know, Amazon's entry into China was terrible, right? It, it did not work. Google's entry yes, into China absolutely. did not work. Yeah. And th there's examples of all of these various types of things. You know, Ford introduced a, a car into Mexico and the car basically was not go, right? It was uh, the Nova, right? No go or whatever. Right. And, yeah, no go. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, you know, th these are things that we do out of, uh, ignorance in some ways, sometimes out of uh, ego, right? Uh, we're so big, we could just force the local right, culture we just go to do there. what we want. That's not going to work. Uh, I can just tell you from running global organizations for many years, you have to tune yourself to that local market, that local buyer. And so I think Yana's advice has been uh, really spot on so far. So uh, let me ask you this. So a as they start thinking about the, the fix for the problem, they think about this true localization and, and effort of identifying the customer, what do they do then to kind of jump into it and take action? Um, well, in order, like when it comes to the listings, what you can do is actually you can hire someone who is experienced in localization and marketing. Definitely, there are a lot of really, really good translators on Fiverr, for instance, or Upwork. And they probably know something about localization and maybe they have done like a lot of e-commerce translations and stuff. But the really important thing is what do they know about Amazon? So if somebody's going to do the listing, do they know that there's a limit for the title or do they know what's the subject matter or backends? Like, are they staying up to date with anything that's going on on Amazon? I and mean, we know like algorithm, you know, changes all the time. You know, like two days ago, I just found out Google changed like a lot of their parameters and my, my website just kind of response rate is like literally 30% instead of 95. And I didn't know this on time and I'm supposed to be, you know, like really, you know, up to date with all of these things. So you really have to find someone who actually understands Amazon and who knows how to do definitely the number one importance for me is keywords because you can have this localized uh, adjusted uh, listing. But what, what is, what, what use, what is it used if you don't have any keywords and nobody can find you? Or if you have amazing pictures and a really good product, your product is definitely going to sell well. But just imagine if you have like really, really good optimized keywords, how, 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 how much better can this be and how, how much profit you could, you could make if all people could find your product just because you're using highly relevant keywords. And this is also something that a lot of people uh, don't think it's important, especially, you know, in that, you know, honeymoon period, they use like some like very too broad keywords or not so relevant keywords and then they just put them also in their PPC campaigns and then then you're just then you're done you know like after the honeymoon period you're gonna go like to page four and you know like you know how they say like where to hide the dead body it's on page two you know <laughs> and so really it's gonna cost you a lot more and money and time and god knows when you're gonna go back and you know it's it's really it's really really difficult if you don't start things the right way well, I, again, this is a very important point for the Osmers out at home or where we are listening. The, the reality is people think Amazon's a store. They think it's a marketplace. They think it's what it's not. It's a search engine. Okay. How do you get found on a search engine? You make something that's relevant. So the algorithm finds you. How do you do that? You make sure your listing is relevant. You have the keyword seeded. You have all the things Yana just talked about. That is the difference between being a point in the galaxy that nobody ever sees, a little star, and you, you're excited about that star. You think your star is valuable. You're proud of that star. Nobody ever will see your star if you're not relevant. And that's, that's a part that I think as sellers, 
it's important for you to understand the, the end customer. They don't, they don't need to understand anything. They need to know when they type in a word, whatever they see, that's their, that their most likely happy results. That's how a search engine works. Amazon's doing everything they can do to put the most relevant, highly uh, satisfying, highly converting experiences in front of that shopper. By the way, that's what Google does as well. That's what every search engine does. That's their only job because they will lose their credibility as that platform if they don't deliver that experience for the shopper. So everything Yana just talked about, as fast as she's able to think of it, as, as easy as it comes out of her just fluently, you guys as sellers need to understand this is the most important thing. And I don't care what language, it could be your native language. If you're not doing this job, you're not going to be as successful as you could otherwise be. So Yana, really, really well done. Now, let's talk about how YLT may be different than some of the other operators out there. What, what do you guys bring to the table that's unique and interesting and, and more fun? Well, honestly, Steve, I'm like really proud of, of our internal processes and I've been working so hard to get this right because like two, three years ago, it was like, as I said, it was like five of us and that, that was it. It was like, you know, not more than that. But like right now, like having a, like a really big team, we, uh, first of all, like we always have a dedicated person for every client, like our project managers for different projects, depending on the difficulty. And then we, after the, the translators are done with the, with their translations, with the keyword, they'll do all, they all do their own keyword research. We use various tools. We use anything from Helium 10, AMZ suggestion expander. And then in Excel, we use some like really cool Excel formulas. And that way using those Excel formulas, like we can actually find out uh, some keywords that nobody from your competitors is ranked for on page one. Uh, it's not possible for all the products, but sometimes I don't know how it actually happens, but people kind of don't get like nobody's indexed for a perfectly high volume keyword. And then you're like, okay, this is it. I'm going to put this in my title because it's fine to get, you know, um, ranked for the keywords that everybody's ranking for. Of course, like you really also want to be relevant for that one, but you also want to, uh, you know, leave some space in that title. If that one golden nugget keyword shows up and you put it over there which has happened for certain products. Um, doesn't happen too often, but what it does, it's, it's really amazing. It, you know, it really gets you some amazing results. Um, and then after the translators are done with the translation pr uh, process, they, we go to our first proofreading team. So we have something called like a two-step verification of the translations. We have two proofreading teams because uh, translations are very subjective, you know, and early in time, like I would get a comment like, you know, my cousin from Spain, he read this listing and he doesn't think it's a well-written one, you know? And this is like a really, I want to avoid because it's very subjective. Everything, everybody can say like, well, I don't like this style. I would have done this way, you know, but is it correct or is it not correct? I just really think that, you know, people should pay attention to the quality by doing a lot of different proofreading and, you know, just kind of uh, having different opinions. Because, you know, if I think this and you think that, there are some things that are gonna be the same. So it's gonna be like, okay, is this good or is it not? You know, like what's the overall decision about this? So I was really happy to, to be able to put something like that before it's sent, sent back to the project manager and to the client so that I know 100% that everything has been done, proofread, proofread and under control. A lot of people use Google Translate as a quality control. Please, guys, don't do that. And a lot of people say like, okay, here is my original text and here is like Google Translate and like, it's not the same. Um, the, the, the translate text with keywords, especially like when it comes to Amazon, it cannot be 100% the same. If it is 100% the same, that means that probably there was no keyword research and there was probably no adjusting to the target uh, marketplace. Sometimes it can happen that it's very close to the original, but because of the keywords you're using, which are completely different for each marketplace, um, even if you compare the US and the UK keyword research, sometimes you're gonna have some differences. So I always say that you have to do the keyword research for every market separately. And I mean, you know, like don't be lazy. I mean, if you're still paying, if you're paying for the tool per month, just do it. I mean, you know, it's gonna waste maybe uh, 20 more minutes of your or your assistant's time but I definitely think that sometimes the keywords are not going to be the same. And th th that is why also the translations are not going to be the same as well. Well, I, th I just can't stress this idea that, you know, 
anybody who's ever seen auto suggest suggest the 50 wrong things i can't tell you how many texts i type and i have to keep backing up it's like no i didn't mean that word i meant the word i typed in right and <laughs> yeah, exactly. this computer thinks it knows more than me but it's not uh very good at the end of the day and if if that's that's how google translate works it, it, you know we're not at the point where those things are uh at the level where humans will be and they probably never will be to, if we're or if we're being honest and more importantly there's this entire subjective idea where marketing i i could give the same listing to a bunch of native english speakers but their quality of marketing knowledge will be the difference exactly. maker in that listing so this idea that you want to get to a literal exact translation of your listing from the source to the destination is absolutely the wrong basis to begin and it's definitely the wrong basis to end and the the fact that you already understand that Yana and the team at YLT not only do they understand the localization not only do they understand all these things they have the checks and balances in place to make sure that there's some cumulative buy in right that one person can't right. just go off the rails they got to convince at least one other person uh who's uh, competent at that language so uh, is that is that a fair assessment am i right about that yes exactly i would absolutely agree with everything you said me too yeah. i i actually also <laughs> agree with me so that's it's really handy that we both have that agreement now let me ask yeah. you this yana um as, as we kind of close it up here what what do you you know how is a typical ylt person you know how many languages do they speak what's their kind of profile where do they live I, i'm just kind of interested yeah well they are scattered across europe um i have for instance a uh, italian translator living in, living in portugal or you know they 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 not necessarily live in their own home home countries but they have all had experience with marketing or amazon if they are uh, marketing translators they get our in-house training which we do it's a uh, it, it's for let's say about like a month month and a half until you can get like a basic like a beginner translator and then they get like a lot of different listings to practice on so it takes a lot of time actually to uh produce um a very very good uh, highly competent amazon translator because um it's more than like you know here's how to use helium 10 here's the keyword research there's more to that they also have to understand like how can they improve that same keyword research and like come up with the you know like there's so many different options there are so many possibilities now that you can combine like find out like what the keywords are ranked uh find better competitors you know like or being like maybe like uh being creative when doing this listing definitely i i just love amazon translations as being a translator myself i know how it can be like so it would be so boring to translate everything from like a how to use a washing machine to i don't know like some uh, really boring contract but amazon translations they actually give you more freedom to translate this in the spirit of the of of your uh, native language so basically they're all uh, highly trained they're very educated translators uh, but uh, not all of them were an amazon translator before they started working with us and i would never give somebody like that uh, you know the right to do a listing without the proper training because the results would just not be that good and you know like everything we do uh, and all the clients have been like usually word of mouth or like referrals and i don't i i've never done any google ads or any sort of paid marketing and this is like something i cannot uh you know i i cannot um ruin my reputation by hiring someone who's not going to be highly competent but uh, i really like having a a remote team and i just think that uh, you know people just uh, love doing amazon translations and i don't think anybody has left our team for the last uh, year and a half for sure and i'm just uh, happy that you know uh, me as a translator i absolutely understand how these people feel and i always kind of wants to uh, make it more exciting or maybe creative include them in other projects so um once a year i do a very big team building i fly people to belgrade so we kind of meet because i i i don't know all of them in person and uh, i just kind of try to keep up with the whole team spirit and you know how hard it is like when you have a remote team to kind of keep them all like you know being a part of a team and not like individual players but this is what i strive to do um you know every every year to just kind of kind of like everybody get get together and just uh, share the stories there's nothing better like when they talk between themselves they're like 
or remember their project with a crazy product and I'm like oh my god you know I've created a monster <laughs> <laughs> well it's obviously uh, you're far more than uh, a translator these days uh, you know businesswoman a manager uh, HR I mean you got it all going that's really great Yana and really building a team and keeping a cohesive team listen at, at five is not easy and at 43 is really really hard so it's a it's a testament to your um, you know diligence and, and certainly your passion for the game so uh, we're gonna close it up here everybody uh, Osmers.com I think we're um, Osmers.com slash 188 is gonna be today's show notes and details and for everybody keeping score at home, YLT is an empowery aligned resource. And uh, so it's something you want to be able to take advantage of as you're an empowery member, get in there and get that done. And Yana, any final words of wisdom you want to leave us with? Well, I would just recommend people to just kind of today go and go in, and, and type your product on the French marketplace or German marketplace and see how, how big potential you have. And I would always recommend German Marketplace. I know a lot of people would go from US to UK because of the language barrier. And people are freaking out because of the language barrier. Like, what does it mean? What if I have like some Chinglish translation? Uh, but the German Marketplace is a five-star marketplace. I like to call it that way. Because all of the other uh, buyers that don't have their own Amazon Marketplace from other countries, they get redirected and they buy from the German Amazon. So you can just imagine like how, how, how many uh, buyers can actually buy your product just if you are available on the German marketplace. Very, very good advice indeed. Osmers, thanks everybody out there for listening again. Don't forget to go leave a review and you can share this thing. Uh, Five-star reviews are rewarded. One-star reviews are hunted and dealt with. <laughs> So just know that there are consequences. Uh, everybody, we appreciate you at Awesomers. We thank Yana for coming on. And, and I, I love being global. I thank you again, uh, Yana, for joining us today. And Awesomers, we'll see you next time, everybody.